reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. People observe nowadays that money, wealth, capital all move around the world a lot more rapidly than used to be the case. And I think, suspect that this makes a real difference in the way governments operate nowadays. Now there's an interface going on between private sector capital and public sector activity that seems to be new, different. I wonder if it really is. Uh, I'd like to talk about that. Well, it seems very clear to me uh, that, um, that politics is being constrained by uh, economic forces, and these forces have a great deal to do with, uh, with capital mobility. Uh, capital is crucial to economic development and prosperity and to the revenues that governments receive. Uh, they've got to get capital, they've got to keep the capital that they have, and they've got to attract it from abroad, especially when government deficits are, are what they are. And as a result, uh, uh, the United States, as well as Germany and New Zealand and Australia, uh, all have to adopt policies that, make, um, that are very attractive to capital, to make sure that the capital doesn't fly off to, the, to other points on the globe and also to make sure that they can draw capital in uh, from other points on the globe. And for that reason, I'm inclined to believe that so many of the policies that we adopted, that were adopted during the 1980s, were a product of, of international capital mobility, uh, as opposed to the product of some sort of new political leadership uh, in the form of Reagan and, and Thatcher. What's any different about government's need for capital? Um, the big difference is, is not so much the need for capital, although capital is becoming more important in production processes than, than labor. Uh, capital is, has become transformed. It's become brain power. It's become information. It used to be that capital was concrete and steel and mile-long plants. Uh, these plants were very immobile, uh, very difficult to get up and move. As a result, uh, governments could think of these, uh, this form of capital as something like an oil well. They could, they could uh, put a head on it and, and, and drain it dry. When capital is in the form of, um, of brain power and information, it basically can be transformed into uh, electro electrical impulses that can be sent around the world at, the, at uh, the touch of a few keys on the computer and at the cost of a telephone call. So you're and not you see, that means you've got to be a whole lot more careful about how you define capital. Precisely. Human capital, real capital. And that's what I want to, before we get too far away from the basic question, actually ask, is it really true? that capital is more mobile, even wealth. I mean, certainly, uh, if you look at certain kinds of short-term capital, if you look at certain countries that have had capital uh, constraints and controls and restrictions and took those off, you could say capital has become more mobile. But if you looked over history, was capital really less mobile during the days of the British Empire? when it moved with great abandon from the UK to, uh, to the colonies. Uh, countries like Canada have been living on imported capital forever. Uh, capital moved uh, from the US uh, in the early days of the common market uh, into Europe. Huge accumulation on the part of America of uh, wealth located in, uh, in Europe. So if I look at sort of the sweep of history, I'd say, is it really, do we get a whole lot more capital of movement or do we just get different types and different forms of it? Or does it move, and, sorry. And then, of course, you've already alluded to one aspect. You're not thinking about, about machinery and factories, you're thinking about brain power. Very definitely. Go ahead, Patricia. Well, uh, given that I, too, believe that capital has been mobile for a long time, technology means that certain kinds of capital, particularly money capital, uh, and intellectual capital yes. can move much more rapidly. Does that really make any difference? 
but I should like to make sure that we're all talking about capital and meaning the same thing by it. Are we going to are we going to talk about money capital, or are we going to talk about any sort of asset? Well, I think I think we ought to we ought to uh, focus first on the uh, physical capital, the human capital, the real components in the production processes, and and. Uh, it, uh, it, it seems to me that if, if for no other thing, nothing else, we could say that capital is more mobile today simply by looking at the personal computer or by looking at computer technology. Uh, the first computer was uh, developed in the late 1940s. It weighed 18 tons, stood three stories high, uh, had only a few Ks of, of memory. Uh, the first um, uh, computer that um, uh, universities got in the early 1960s probably had only 8 Ks of memory and spread throughout a an office. Uh, today I can um, uh, have the power of, of the first mainframes that were generally available uh, on my lap. And basically I can, I can take what was a whole office building with me across the country uh, fairly easily. And uh, then to, to acknowledge the fact that what's critically involved in, in most production processes today is, is not so much the labor and the actual physical components, the, uh, the um, uh, what seems to be criti of critical value is the ideas that go into the design of, of um, uh, pieces of equipment and, and, and pieces of uh, production units. And I think George Gilder had a point when he said that the 98% uh, of the, of, of the um, uh, value of, uh, of the uh, microchip was in the idea that went into computing it. 2% of the value is its material, that is the sand, uh, the silicon. Uh, that's used in it. So I, I see it as, as definitely transformed. We could go on and, and take note of the fact that factories are, have been downsizing. Um, the payout period for, for uh, plant and equipment has, has been going down. Uh, and in all these ways, it seems to me that uh, uh, the mobility has, uh, has drastically uh, increased uh, over the past 20 or 30 years. I mean, again, there's, um, I mean, it's obviously if one, if one calls the uh, the computer and especially its laptop or notebook incarnations uh, capital, that's a whole, whole lot more mobile than the big VACs used to be that, uh, that, that, that companies used to use. That's correct. Um, but you're really saying more than that. I think it'd be good to sort of separate uh, these various aspects. It's one thing to move a computer. It's quite something else to move an idea. I mean, there again, what you might really have in mind is not that capital moves so much, but as some people have argued, that in this age of uh, increasingly rapid communications, ideas get, tr get transmitted faster. Therefore, it takes less time between the time uh, uh, something is invented or some idea is concocted in one country before the information spreads uh, around the world and is adapted to and adopted around the world. Then the question is, is that capital? If it is, it's a different kind of capital from the computer that moves around. And it may very well make a difference as to which of these we're talking about if we want to ask, how have these things impacted on government policies and government behavior, as well as private yeah. behavior? I think I see it rather as if we are talking about ideas and innovations moving around, I see it as sort of a just an extensive logical development of the sort of innovation that's been going on in all of modern history. The fact that it's going on more rapidly uh, perhaps makes a difference. But when you were talking, what came to mind for me is, for example, our perception and the resultant policy reaction to the Tiananmen Square uprising was probably different because those students were faxing uh, people they knew in, in the United States. So in that sense, we can get information around a lot more rapidly. And we can do it because someone came up with an innovative idea. And, and you see in that, that example of, of, the, of the students in Tiananmen Square faxing uh, news media in the Western world, and a grand example of the extent to which the, the power of government is, is curbed. Now, in the end, uh, the communist uh, uh, government uh, uh, stomped on the students. But they did it probably with less ferociousness than they would have in, in uh, decades or 100 years gone by. Uh, and they did it with much more hesitancy. And, and by the way, the communist 
the, uh, the communist uh, Chinese system is in fact giving way to, uh, to many of these market forces because they do, in, they do need uh, investment uh, in their country and they're doing what they can to assure uh, uh, entrepreneurs around the world that, they, that their capital is in fact uh, uh, safe, that they don't ex intend to go back to the old ways adopted 50 or 100 years ago and that they are gradually liberalizing and they're liberalizing with the express intent to attract more capital uh, into their country. Well, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, and I think that we can see evidence of liberalization with the express intent of attracting capital if we look at the Mexican case. It yes. seems to me that uh, one of the most important aspects of the pending NAFTA agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement, is that uh, it's very, very important to the current Mexican government that that be undertaken mutually um, in order that that government be seen to have enough political stability to keep capital coming in that it's crucial, NAFTA is a crucial element of Mexico's stabilization and growth plan in the longer run. Now, in that sense, I think that there's a real connection there between capital flows, political stability, and external perceptions of same. But I still would question okay. whether that's any different uh, from what it would have been at any point in the past, except that things can move more rapidly. I think it makes a, it, I'm not sure there's a qualitative difference. Well, there, there may not be. I think we've, we've passed through some sort of threshold. I, I agree with you, Swin, that, that over the years, capital mobility uh, was always there. Capital could move, move among the principalities in, in uh, Europe. It could move among the countries. It could move across the Atlantic. Uh, we're, and over the years, uh, the mobility was gradually uh, getting greater and greater and greater. I think it, it appears to me that we, we literally somewhere between 1930 and 1975, uh, we passed through something of a, um, of a uh, threshold where the mobility seemed to really take hold. And during the 70s and, and, and 1980s, uh, concern about capital mobility, and as a consequence, the concern about the competitiveness of domestic policies, vis-a-vis -vis policies in other countries around the world, uh, became a, a dominant theme. One of the re reasons uh, Thatcher was arguing for uh, uh, reductions in tax rates in her country was basically they needed to get the tax rates down, they needed to stimulate investment in their country, but they needed also to attract capital. The United States followed suit, Germany followed suit, uh, France followed suit, Italy followed suit, New Zealand. The, it, and uh, the reason I question whether the response here is necessarily an ideological one, that it was all Reagan, Thatcher, and their free market uh, economics, because these shifts in policies tended to uh, span the, the political spectrum from highly capitalistic market or market oriented economy to highly socialistic uh, economies. Well, I think that's, I think, I mean, that certainly is right. You, you made several points. It certainly is right that it spanned the, uh, the spectrum. You see the, re the revision of uh, trade uh, policy approaches in Latin America, for example, from the uh, import substituting to the, um, to the more outward looking regimes that are being put in place. I'd also agree that something did happen in that time span that you mentioned, though I'd probably still want to argue it was at least as much the communications revolution that enabled ideas to be transmitted faster than anything else. And I would finally also agree capital is essential. See, there's really a difference between the argument that says capital is moving more rapidly or, it, or its more rapid movement is the major force that's, that's um, shaping the modern world and a quite different statement, which is you need capital. I mean, what we've recognized is that you cannot over the long pull uh, assure populations of rising living standards unless you provide them with increasing quantities of capital, better quality of capital, and as we're learning in the late 20th century, it's not always physical capital. It's increasingly human capital. And at some point, I'd like to uh, explore this idea uh, yeah. a little bit. Uh, uh, we feel competitiveness pressures, whatever those, um, 
uh, things may mean. I have a colleague who's not sure that we who talk about competitiveness know what we're talking about, but uh, let's assume for a minute that we do. We might want to come back to this as well. Uh, what do we need in this country? Simply more physical capital? Is all this discussion of infrastructure the buzzword of uh, late 1992? If we just got infrastructure in place, everything would be well? Not so sure. Sure it will help. But if we don't improve the human capital, the skills of our workers, we're not going to be able to compete. And here we get back to your point of rapid uh, transmission of information. All around the world, Americans for a long time used to have an advantage. They invented something took a long time for the rest of the world to catch up. During that period, you had some chance and opportunity expo to exploit your, uh, your innovative talents uh, and abilities. Now, without any, uh, any uh, lapse at all, it seems sometimes, uh, information gets transmitted, ideas get imitated, clones get produced. Staying ahead of the game, becomes more and more of a problem, and staying ahead without having human capital might in fact be the major problem for the United States. Well, there's no doubt in my mind human, human capital is, is, is superseding the, the physical capital. Uh, uh, it's becoming uh, the more expensive item, uh, as evident by the growing premium on, on college education that rose from something he had a college educated workers in early 1980s earned maybe 30 to 40 percent more than their uh, high school counterparts. At the end of the 1980s it was 75 or, or 80 percent and we're probably hiding some income there. But clearly uh, human capital is becoming the dominant force and as a consequence I think um, uh, these forces have expo exposed the soft underbelly of, uh, of the American system and that's the public school system that doesn't seem to be uh, making the grade and vis-a-vis and -vis the Japanese school system, the German school system. Uh, we're, we're being forced, kicking and screaming, uh, to reconsider uh, very seriously uh, coming up with some new ways of producing this human capital that I agree with you uh, uh, seems to be uh, uh, rising in, in, in relative importance. But why are we being forced, to use your term, why are we so concerned now relative to our levels of concern 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, well, 20 years ago. And that I think that's a function of, uh, largely a function of trade flows, uh, that we now see ourselves as beleaguered competitively. Since, at, at the end of World War II, we were the clear world leader in trade, in politics, in production, in any measure, any measure you want to use. That isn't the case anymore, and we see ourselves now as about to be bettered by the Japanese or whoever. Oh. And, and that perception comes from the fact that we don't dominate in markets, I think, to the extent that we used to dominate in markets. I think we still dominate politically. That's another question. But uh, we, I think that Global restructuring with respect to trade is forcing domestic restructuring industrially. It's happening in a lot of countries. And we notice increasingly that our labor force is not up to scratch. That means we're not able to produce uh, what we think we ought to be producing. We're not able to be competitive, whatever we want to mean by that. Um, and that's the human capital problem. But all this is a result of the fact that our competitors with respect to trade uh, have become stronger, which I happen to think is a good thing, and we are just not so clearly dominant in the world in that respect, and we're having trouble learning to compete. But it, to me, again, it's, it's no less painful for people who lose jobs in the process of restructuring domestically, but nevertheless, it's a natural progression in a world that's increasingly competitive. Well, I mean, it's certainly been trade, but it's also again been this, uh, the, the um, uh, dissemination of information. And then, of course, you have to remember there was this good time for the United States after World War II when uh, Europe uh, lay largely destroyed and uh, there was no really meaningful competition uh, anywhere else. Japan was uh, just developing and the, uh, the, uh, the tigers and so on today uh, just, if they were puppies or cubs, uh, we didn't know about them yet. 
Um, so it was easy uh, to, uh, to dominate, and I think to some extent we make a mistake in this country if we use that period as the benchmark, because unnatural. We were far more dominant than uh, would uh, naturally have been the case. A war had helped uh, uh, do that. So Europe has, uh, Europe has rebuilt. Then these other countries have come, um, come uh, into, uh, into the market and are now significant players. And again, to, to, to stick with the theme of uh, human capital for a minute, all you have to do is look at what's happened to literacy rates in countries like Korea. Right. That came from way behind and have in a matter of de two decades, maybe a quarter century at most, basically caught up. When they first began to sell in world markets, they were producing clone products, commodities, the blueprints for which they could buy on the shelf. They didn't create ideas. They're now sponsoring in Korea research and development. They've got the human capital to produce ideas themselves. This is a new competitive game for Americans. Uh, uh, and those changes, I mean, that, that's probably uh, where one perceives these changes, that everywhere we, everywhere we look, uh, countries and peoples have, uh, have achieved capabilities that some 30 years ago seemed to be uniquely ours. And I, I would be the first to agree that, um, that it's both, a, that, that much of what we're talking about here is a communication revolution as, as well as the transformation of capital. Without this communication, um, the, the fact that capital can be put around the world is, is more or less meaningful, meaningless because it can't be controlled. And the fact that you can correspond uh, with people in a matter of a few seconds, your managers and so forth, uh, What's happening is that we're transforming um, the concept of a national economy. It used to be that, that we used to think of the American economy as contained within the 48 states, uh, plus the, the two others outside. Uh, uh, but now it's, uh, it's, it's much more integrated. Our, uh, we've, this, this process of, of capital movement has been moving out there uh, to all points on the, on the globe. And, uh, and, and, and as a result, it's, it's resulted in a great deal more trade. Uh, used to be 20, 30 years ago, uh, trade represented, what, 6, 7 percent of, of gross domestic product. Now it represents approximately 15 percent right. 15 or so, and that's a tremendous, and, and the, the capacity of uh, producers to switch from domestic sources to international sources has just gone up uh, fairly dramatically, and the capacity of American producers switched to foreign labor. I mean, an, an interesting uh, anecdote here is that if you have a claim filed with New York Life, uh, you send that claim to a post office box at Kennedy Airport. That claim is then sent uh, by New York Life by overnight courier to Dublin, Ireland driven 60 miles to some little shop outside the city and it's then put into a computer and it's then sent by way of satellite back to New York Life's headquarters somewhere in New Jersey I'm, under, I'm, I'm told for all practical purposes the human capital that's in Ireland has become a part of the American labor force we have in fact imported those people we have allowed them to immigrate into our economy in a way and and so I, I see you know the, the growth in trade as being a reflection of these forces I think uh, the Europe 92 is a response to the fact that they had to get more efficient and then I see NAFTA and so forth as, as a response to the European uh, attempt to uh, eliminate their trade barriers and to become more efficient. Just I mean, one of the things you said, and I think that's, that's a very important additional element, is uh, pertains to really how the nature of trade has changed. Uh, it's not just that there's been more trade and the world's become more integrated through trade, but the nature of it has changed. We used to think about we export to you and you export to us and we produce some goods and you buy them from us and, and, and so on. What we now get far more is the globalization of production. It's not that uh, a commodity is fully and totally produced in the United States and then is sold uh, in Japan or in Europe and vice versa, but a product that, I mean, people see it in their automobiles all the time, the product that's uh, the final appearance of which looks American, at least a product which comes from the United States, has parts in it from all over, all over the world. Um, the integration of the economy in that sense uh, is important. That creates wealth in its own right because it enables human beings and countries to specialize. Mm 
and we've driven this division of labor that's always been, I mean, since Adam Smith at the heart of the idea of trade and exchange, driven that to the point now where we're fine-tuning it, where we're, we're globalizing production. We take a commodity apart and have various components of it produced in various parts of the world wherever that can be uh, done best. So it becomes increasingly difficult. You said the Irish, we imported Irish, Irish labor, maybe, maybe not. But it becomes extremely difficult to say a commodity or a service is uniquely American or uniquely Mexican or, or uniquely Japanese. And when you say we globalize, we look for the most efficient way to produce a product wherever the bits and pieces are. That's the market that's doing that. It's the private sector. It's the the um, enterprise that we expect to produce the best possible product for the lowest possible market price. And the uh, business person does that in whatever way uh, is possible and that often involves bringing in elements that are not necessarily domestic. This is happening all over the world and it is very important that those trade flows aren't Americans selling automobiles to one country and another country selling textiles to us or something of that sort. Uh, but it is uh, the private sector that's doing that mixing. It's not governments making decisions about how things shall move around. But it makes it tough for governments to behave the way it, they once did. It, so. in, incredibly so, yeah. And then one of the more interesting statistics I've heard lately is something like 50% of all of our imports are actually um, uh, domestic firms uh, bringing in goods from their foreign affiliates. Which means that, yes, it's th this component is international trade, but it's really interdepartmental transfers because these companies have become worldwide. Another element of this is to the extent that a, that a firm in Irvine, California uh, has to compete globally, that is, firms from all around the world, uh, that firm has, is, is forced, as never before, to look for the most cost-effective venue for production. And if it's not in Irvine, California, he's got to look elsewhere because if, if he doesn't find it and somebody else finds it in the world, then he, he'll find that he'll be suffering a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis this Japanese firm or Taiwanese firm or New Zealand firm or, or whatever. But that's the globalization of the process that we have always expected American enterprise to go through. You know, we, we have always expected the market to provide us with the best possible goods at the lowest possible price. Yes. And it's just now that the search process and how that's accomplished encompasses the world and that's not right. just the town you work in or the country or the state or whatever. And that's right. And it, and it also means that governments are, be, uh, are being forced to compete with each other in another more direct way. I understand that in downtown LA, there are 40 offices of foreign economic development uh, uh, committees or what development boards that is Japan and Germany and so forth all have offices down there. Now what do, what do you mean? What are these governments competing for? What do you mean they're governments looking, are competing? They're looking around around Southern California as elsewhere in the West looking for disenchanted firms firms that, that they might be able to uh, attract to their home base. For that matter when I was out in Kansas City uh, Missouri. There was an article in the Kansas City Star about a, an economic development posse that was being sent. They had a big uh, uh, send-off for them. They were coming to Southern California because they had heard that uh, taxes and government regulations were onerous in, down here and that uh, firms were, uh, uh, int were becoming very concerned and might be attracted out of the state. And so they were coming down here and um, it's, it's this kind of process that uh, it, People, <coughs> government officials in other parts of the world have become more mobile. They can go into other, other uh, countries, other states, so forth, and uh, try to appeal to the economic interests of the, of the firms in, in the countries. And, and, and this is another real direct way that they are they're having to compete. Uh, Governor Pete Wilson in, in California, in my view, is, is, is hitting it on the head when he sets up a commission and says, we've got to come up with a way of making California uh, more competitive, not only with uh, regards to the other states, but with regards to other countries around, around the rest of the world. Because, in fact, Pete Wilson is having to confront officials from these other governments on his own turf. You see, I mean, I, that's 
That's that's right. And one way to think about that is to think about markets becoming increasingly uh, desegmented or unsegmented, uh, more more interrelated. Therefore, arbitrage. Patricia has been talking about markets doing it. What happens in particular is people arbitrage between markets where prices for things are high and markets where they are low. And what a lot of governments at the national level, what they're finding out is what state governments have known for many, many years. A state would risk losing business if its regulatory and tax policies deviated too far from the policies of its neighbors. And countries are learning increasingly that if you tax or penalize or restrict uh, business activity more than, uh, their, than competing countries, you run the risk of, um, of losing business. So in that sense, the increasing integration of the world economy, the increasing speed with which uh, information gets uh, disseminated, uh, all are impacting on the ability of governments to uh, to move, manipulate, and shape uh, the uh, shape particular policies. Trade policy is an example. Every time the U.S. government comes under pressure from one group to uh, provide some protection, there will be another group that will be hurt by that very uh, proposed action. Um, automobiles have been examples. I mean, our some cars that have Japanese names on them turn out, in fact, to be pretty much produced in the United States. And some that are GM, quote, GM products turn out to have been wholly or to a significant extent been produced someplace else. How do you know? Yes. Well, it seems to me that one clear area where government is, is having to confront uh, competition because of technology uh, is in this, the the primitive fax machine. I say it's primitive because it, there, it's been superseded by other uh, cheaper means of, of, um, of uh, communication. But, uh, uh, you know, if you want to send a letter across town by the, by the U.S. Postal Service, which is a government agency of sorts, somewhat independent, uh, it's going to cost you 29 cents. If you want to send it by uh, a fax, it won't cost you a dime. It won't even cost you a dime. In fact, the cost will be zero. If you want to send a letter from uh, California to uh, Washington, uh, the maximum it will cost you is uh, uh, 25 uh, cents. That's 4 cents, 14 percent less than a first class stamp. And you can get that price down to 10 cents if you're willing to delay transmission until after 11 o'clock at night and so forth. What I'm saying here is we had a government protected monopoly for a long year. You couldn't go into business. They were even suing teenagers that wanted to compete. But technology has, has enabled uh, 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 another mode of transportation, I mean, communication to come in. And, and this is given, it, no doubt, is giving the people at the post office uh, some frightening thoughts as to what they're going, what would happen if they raise uh, uh, stamp prices again or if they cut back service to four days as they have indeed uh, threatened to do so. So that's a, that's a clear-cut case in which a government agency is confronting some newfound competition that's been created by this, this technology we're talking about. Well, we've seen instances in, um, I can think of periods in the United Kingdom when uh, at one point postal workers went out on strike and in fact to the business community within a very few days it made very little difference to them because there were so many individual efforts that appeared almost instantaneously on the market. But it seems to me just a logical development with respect to postal services, for example, or any other service a government provides, that uh, over time the nature of that market's going to change. There may be more competition therein. Um, again, the technology question seems to me uh, um, a matter of degree and not substance, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Um, let me try the, the technology aspect from another point of view and see what you think. Um, I started with a question about capital mobility, and I'll go back to a version of that. Um, we hear that, uh, let's say we, I'm, I'm trying to speak here for the general public, uh, we understand that uh, money moves around the world pretty rapidly and uh, in great quantity, and that that somehow makes a big difference to governments uh, in a way that uh, is uh, different from the past. Um, that uh, you started out by saying that we compete for capital, and I think when you were saying that you meant 
make money with the governments of other countries, meaning that our government is in competition with other governments. Uh, that's what I meant when I referred to Mexico. The Mexican government uh, competes for incoming capital both to its private sector and to the public sector. Now, what difference does it make the way money moves around the world and the fact that it can move around so much more rapidly than used to be the case? Uh, because it can now be transferred instantaneously. Does that make a difference? Um, I don't know if you're hesitant to, to open up the uh, topic of capital markets, but, uh, but I think that that's an interesting one uh, when we note that, um, uh, for example, we have all been working very hard at trying to talk Germany into lowering its interest rates within that country. Why should we care? Because those interest rates attract capital. And that movement of capital affects uh, prices, exchange rates, uh, and interest rates in all other countries that compete for the same capital. Now, that can happen a lot more rapidly than used to be the case. Uh, again, I'm not sure it makes a difference substantively, but it uh, certainly is a difference in degree. And I think that um, it, this really does impact government policy very directly. Yeah, and it, it seems to me that in uh, the fall of 1992, when in fact the governments were uh, trying to get Germany to, to do all of this, it seems to me that all the government officials were dancing to the capital markets tune as opposed to the other way. I don't remember the particulars of those events, uh, Patricia, but uh, it seems to me that there were, uh, there was a situation when they all got together and they, they were responding to the, to the market there as opposed to uh, the governments actually being in firm control uh, of those markets. Well, governments, uh, governments need money. Yes. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> because governments need money, they need to attract money capital. Yeah. And the internationalization of the money capital market uh, means that government policy is somewhat, uh, well, is very much affected by international capital markets and vice versa. That's right. But uh, the, I, st I don't mean that to sound as if uh, the international capital market is uh, some sort of single entity or that there is a group of speculators that gets together and makes decisions about what they're going to do to which government on yeah. what day. Oh, I, yeah, I understand. And it seems to me that it's, a, that it's the markets in combination with the relatively large debt that governments have that, that's causing uh, some concern for governments. I, I know when, uh, when President-elect uh, Bill Clinton um, articulated a few proposals and it agitated the international money markets. He was very fearful that uh, his proposals would lead to an increase in, in interest rates. And, and the problem here is that let's suppose that uh, uh, Bill Clinton proposes to raise taxes on the rich and the international money bondholders, um, they see that as potentially stifling the growth of the American economy, and that means incomes won't rise, it means government revenues won't rise, it means uh, that the government will have a bigger deficit. If they see it that way, uh, they're going to be concerned about uh, the value of their holdings going down, interest rates are going to go up immediately, and it's quite possible that, that a government official like Bill Clinton, who sees a $4 trillion debt out there, can recognize that a 1% increase in the interest payment on the federal debt can indeed uh, take away $40 billion worth of, uh, of discretionary spending uh, that he might underdo. And as a consequence, he's got to respond uh, to those bondholders. Uh, uh, as I, I heard one free market economist uh, quip the other day in bondholders we trust uh, in the sense of putting a control on, on Clinton or other things, that if, in fact, he wants to uh, uh, push more deficits and so forth, he might indeed uh, actually worsen his capacity. I don't know what the figures are on these things, but at least is a threat uh, to his uh, domestic program, his in discretionary authority. Mm -hmm. I, mean, that there, I would say, Patricia, there is, in fact, a substantive impact uh, 
these things do make a substantive difference. But now we're talking about really a very different kind of uh, capital. It's not capital that necessarily goes into that, that sloshes around international uh, financial markets uh, and puts pressure on particular exchange rates. A lot of that is short-term capital. Not all of this will go into, uh, into uh, the kinds of human or physical capital formation that we talked about before, but it, but it affects the, the, um, the way economies uh, respond. Of course, any time you have these problems, these uh, runs on currencies, you have them because governments try to uh, enforce exchange rates that seem no longer to be compatible, consistent with what market forces uh, are, are doing. Sometimes you get markets testing these, these exchange rates. Um, but it certainly, I would certainly agree with you, Richard, that um, if uh, uh, a reduction of interest rates uh, would make a huge difference as far as the, the uh, debt burden of the United States uh, is concerned. Uh, no question about that. And that's one of the problems in the United States, an increasing part of the, uh, the federal budget deficit is this non-discretionary uh, obligation of the government to pay interest on the debt. And uh, in an integrated international capital market, right. the interest rate uh, that the federal government pays is affected by what goes on in the rest of the world. And it happens right now that everybody thinks this particular problem could be solved or at least alleviated by beating up on the Bundesbank and getting the Bundesbank to reduce the uh, uh, reduce interest rates. But it would be a real mistake for the Clinton administration or any U.S. administration to think that the answer to the problem of the U.S. debt and the burden on the debt somehow rested uh, uh, in Germany and with, Bund with the Bundesbank's uh, interest rate policies. But it points up, it, I mean, this makes nicely the very interesting point that we are increasingly aware of the interaction between domestic and international issues. That interaction has always been there but it is of increased importance nowadays as we have globalized the movement of trade and of information and of all the kinds of capital that you were talking about. But I think that um, uh, our administration uh, elect, if you like, uh, has to be keenly aware of that trade-off. That has always been there, but is just in, but our, I think our sensitivity to it is heightened certainly. And uh, as economies have become more interdependent, these things make a more immediate and a larger difference. Yeah. And that interdependence is basic. That interdependence is in part built upon the technology that you started talking about. That's right. I, but it, that, it's several forces going on. It's yeah. just not one. It's not the... But there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here, isn't it? I mean, look, the French, French are going around and saying, you know, and they, if, if, they, if the French franc finally has to be uh, devalued or let go uh, loose to find its own new value, the French will blame Helmut Schlesinger and the, and the Bundesbank for its, ex quote, excessively conservative management of monetary policy, as having brought this upon uh, France. Prior to these crises, the Italian governments and the French were saying that this need to um, tied to the, uh, to the German uh, Deutsche Mark was imposing substantial burdens on their macroeconomies. And here's the chicken and the egg. I mean, they wanted to be more closely integrated with Germany within Europe to eliminate uh, differences in exchange rates, to create this monetary union. They were pushing for integration in some sense even faster than markets were actually uh, uh, forcing it. Now they're getting to difficulty and they're somehow blaming this, again, in all kinds of places where maybe some blame belongs, but probably more uh, at the source, where this, the, the speed with which they're forcing um, the, uh, the common currency, for instance, on the, the Danish example, the Danish uh, 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 rebellion vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the Maastricht Treaty would be an example. So one can't always say that markets are forcing integration and the consequence of integration on governments. Sometimes you actually get the thing going the other way around. Yes, all these governments would, would like their systems, monetary systems, to be more closely attached to the German monetary system for the sake of perceptions of stability that we talked about before, to almost force themselves 
to uh, control inflation, to be seen to be uh, more stable. But the cost of that it, uh, may be very high in, because that kind of tying, they, they uh, tend to, they want to lose control to some extent of their exchange rates, uh, to tie them very closely to, in effect, the German exchange rate. And yet when they lose that policy weapon, if you like, their macroeconomy is in very big trouble. So in this case, it is an instance of where policy uh, has tried to overwhelm market forces and has had to back down uh, if, in fact, markets aren't ready for that kind well, of Well, governments policy. even themselves aren't ready, I would say. So that's, right, that's, that's the, what I meant. There's a bit of schizophrenia right. there. They want to have their exchange rates uh, linked. Uh, fixed exchange rates in the European monetary. But they don't want to pay the but price. But they don't want to pay the price by coordinating more fully uh, their policies in one yeah. way or another, either at the German Bundesbank level or at, or at some intermediate. So they want their cake, but they want to eat it too. Yeah, it seems to me that they're being led by something of an invisible hand, uh, that they don't quite understand and they're kicking and screaming uh, at times uh, in um, uh, resisting uh, the, the consequences of it. Uh, and, c Patricia, can I get b back to a point that you were making a minute ago and just elaborate on it and, and, and take it very seriously, which is that, you know, we've, we've had this growing mobility, we've had this technological development to process for some time, and, and your concern is that it is a matter of degree and, and we may be just, government just gradually moving into a new epoch uh, in which it is, its domestic policies are being constrained. And, and I, I think that is true, but I suspect that 30, 40 years from now, we're going to look back on this last 30 years as something of an electronic revolution um, on par with uh, the Industrial Revolution. And we're going to think about it because the economies in so many ways have been transformed. And there are so many things that have been changed that, that anecdotally uh, don't say much individually, but add up. And, and I, I say before, before say the 1970s, uh, government as a percentage of income was just marching upward. Tax rates were just marching upward. Uh, regulations were just marching upward. There was just a whole number of ways in which governments were becoming progressively more and more involved uh, in their in their economies. Uh, government workforces, minimum wage, in real terms, you know, these kinds of things. But somewhere along about 1975, things just changed. And um, uh, a grand example is that Germany's government as a percent of G GDP before 1975 was just on an upward track. After 1975, it levels off like a plateau. Soon after that, Great Britain leveled off. Soon after that, the United States leveled off. And soon after that, just about every country in the Western world leveled off. Yeah. And, and, and in cahoots, with, in coordination with all of this, we had a rash of uh, tax reform movements. And everybody kept t started talking about uh, the supply side effects. You don't have to be a supply side theorist uh, to acknowledge the fact that countries became concerned about the incentive effects of taxes. They began to deregulate more or less across the board. They began to privatize services. Uh, the minimum wage, the grand example of a, of a standard government intrusion, peaked out in 1968. And ever since then, it, it's gone down in spite of the best efforts of Congress to raise it to, from time to time. Well, I, uh, I'd like to ask, first of all, what you said something leveled off in 1975. Uh, uh, government what? Total government spending, German total German government spending as a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product. And, and you're saying we leveled off? No, it, it, the United States leveled off. During the 1980s, it leveled off at about 22 to 24 percent. So there were jiggles in, in the data. But you, if you plot out government expenditures as a percent of, of gross domestic product for the whole rash of the OECD countries, you'll find that up until the late 1970s, they were growing. And after that, there was almost a cap on all of them. That by itself is no big deal, other than the fact it is interesting that they all seem to level at the same time. Or, or cap off. But when you combine with that the interest in tax reform, the interest in deregulation, the interest in privatization, and making governments more policies more competitive, and that these efforts 
uh, span the ideological uh, spectrum. And then you had Gorbachev saying, you know, we've got to liberalize our economy so that we can get more foreign capital, so that we can become uh, um, a modern industrial power of, of some sort. They were, you know, first-rate military power, third-rate industrial power, and he sees it, or saw it uh, in, in Perestroika as a um, as a problem with with incentives, too many taxes, too many regulations. But does it surprise you that, given the globalization that we have experienced over the last decades, that we pass everything around. We pass recessions around. We pass inflation around. I mean, it doesn't surprise me much that we pass policy efforts around. And given the leading role that the United States has had yeah. in the world, uh, it doesn't surprise me that much of the rest of the Western world undertook to emulate uh, a uh, an alteration in the approach to macro management uh, that, that we saw. Here. But you see this a lot, don't you? I mean, it's uh, sometimes you didn't say what so. you thought the the reasons were, but one thing that might come to mind is you'd had a lot of policies in place for a long time. Uh, things had been tried and had uh, turned out not to work all that well. I mean, you can Gorbachev. Uh, you know, after all, that that system had been in existence for a long time. Yeah. It wasn't that yeah. overnight they decided uh, they didn't like yeah. it. They tried it, and they were increasingly seeing that it really wasn't working. Yes, I don't. The tremendous change in Latin America, for example, mm -hmm. away from the the import substitution regimes to the export to the to the more open. Uh, um, externally oriented regimes only came after two decades of trying to make the other work and failing to make the other work. And of course the 70s were this big roller coaster period uh, for the uh, United States and the West. The Bretton Woods system collapsed in the early 70s. That was what after 25, 30 years of being in existence, that system had failed to, to work. Then there was the wrenching experiences with the uh, oil prices, the crisis of seven, the early 70s and the late 70s, and it just looks like a whole bunch of things. It was, you know, we were three decades uh, into the post-war period, a whole bunch of things that had looked good early on, had been tried, either if they ever worked, weren't working anymore, or weren't working in the way in which people wanted them, or a good time to change, uh, change the approach. I would certainly take uh, the, the liberalization undertaken uh, in Central and Eastern Europe as something substantively uh, different, uh, that is a partly a reaction to failures within those systems, I would not be willing to interpret them as uh, the Central European effort to, well, they saw Maggie Thatcher and they believed. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I don't think that theirs was an extension of this move that, that you were characterizing in the Western world. I think that theirs was um, uh, a, that move toward liberalization was in very large part a reaction to their own internal dynamic and, and again, systems that they had tried for decades that had uh, run their course, that had proven to be so inefficient that they were ready to try something different. And, and the only other model around, uh, fundamentally, was what the West was doing. But uh, I, I do think, uh, I would agree with Sven, that what we saw occurring from middle, late 70s through the 80s uh, I would see as um, a, a, a one logical development from the um, from the history preceding it that the systems had worn out were in need of fixing. Um, we have not got the answer um, to how best to manage systems, manage macro systems. I mean, that's, it's something now that uh, we would like to see the world very simply, to say uh, you can be market-oriented or you can be non-market-oriented. Fundamentally, that's the case. We have good evidence that market systems work better. We can agree that far. But then how to make those systems work best by your own country's judgments, uh, no one's sorted out. And we're all in the process of living in systems that are basically market-oriented, 
in the West, uh, and that are increasingly globalized. And they, uh, our lives have become somewhat more complicated because of this globalization. Uh, and I think right now Central and Eastern Europe is, would like some of the benefits to be had from market systems that they have not managed to generate with managed systems, with centrally planned systems. Well, Jack, that's an interesting question, which I hope Richard can uh, get into a little bit. I mean, when systems, quote, systems fail or, or approaches fail, like particular policy approaches, the import substitution, um, what happens then? I mean, do, do countries then decide that, well, they're going to chuck this, but they've got this nice alternative model that they're going to give up Ford and buy Nissan or what? They've got this, this, this replacement model sitting on the shelf. All they have to do is pull it down and, uh, and use it. That's the struggle now in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. And what strikes me about the period of Thatcher and Reagan was that their answer was there isn't another system we can pull off the shelves of managing this, managing that, getting from better to best in Patricia's terms, but rather saying, forget it, you can't do it. Stop trying to manage, hand it over to, um, to market forces. That's not always the way things work. It's not always the case that when one, when one regime is thrown out that the um, collective answer is to, let, to, to, to hand it over to the automatic mechanisms, whatever they may be, but rather to try to manage in, in different ways. And we haven't seen the end of the story in Eastern not Europe and the Soviet Union yet. Do you know, this may be a subject for another conversation. <laughs> I don't think that, I think that these, these are systems in search of shapes and identities. They're not necessarily going to look like us. Uh, we haven't got the answers. I mean, that's becoming increasingly evident. And our, the, our answers that we've found don't always look as if they can be accommodated in their systems. So I think that uh, what develops there is very much, I wonder now when we look back in 20 or 40 years, uh, how those systems will look, how they will see this period, but I think that we're still very much in a period of transition, and I think that we ought to get together another time and talk about that. <laughs> you bring the beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it would seem to me that, uh, that I agree with, with both Patricia and Schwinn, um, that there are alternative hypotheses for explaining what has developed, that, that there isn't one force out there. Indeed, what I um, am, am trying to press is the argument that these international global forces are crucially important in, in, in causing policymakers to search for an improved system. And they're going to come up with some innovations. I, I think what's really interesting here is we have market forces guiding domestic politics toward an end that none of us know what it's going to be. But I think that's very much the result of this growing globalization. And it is very much enhanced by technological development. 